Thank you, Patrick, for playing for us. In Matthew 11, we have this unusual question that John the Baptist is asking. Matthew 11, after Jesus finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect someone else? Now, we know from the Bible that many people in those days believed that John might be the Messiah, that he is the one that God sent. According to Luke, it was the angel who announced his birth, agent Gabriel, just like Jesus. But unlike Jesus, he was descending from priest on both his father's side and his mother's side. Unlike Jesus, he wasted no time in carpenter shop. He was an evangelist from the day one. He lived uh, a life isolated from all sinful influences, away from big cities, mm -hmm. the desert. While Jesus was eating fancy suppers in town with people who drank too much and were laughing too loud. John scavenged for his food in the wilderness. And if, if he found something to eat, he ate. If he didn't, he fasted. He avoided anything that had to do with the wine. Not to diminish or soften the sharpness of his focus on God. Everything about him was screaming about his holiness, his way of life, his clothing, and of course, his message. No one like that spoke like that in the last 500 years. Remember when the dominion of Babylon has ended and people expected during the Ezra and Nehemiah time that now finally now god is going to do something great and we are going to be the superpower again israel was passed from one superpower to another to medo persia to greece to egypt to syria then to rome like a tarnished trophy handed down from one empire to next the chosen people became conquered people they were valued only for the ability to pay taxes, not for the message or contribution to religious life. What was missing in the old days was a voice from God. Imagine being a small child at a family worship and you sing all these hymns, our God is great, our God is powerful, and you dare to ask that but I don't see that. The Romans built Antonia Fortress, a pinnacle of it just a little higher than the temple, just to show them who is the boss here. You see the Roman soldiers on the street, street corners, and you feel like, how can we sing, our God is good, our God is great, our God is powerful, if you don't see any evidence of this? And then, finally, after almost 500 years, someone appears who is speaking God's language, talking about sin instead of profit, talking about repentance instead of compromise, someone who is not interested in helping people become more productive members of society. He wants them to enter God's coming kingdom, and he's happy to pronounce judgment on anyone who stood in the way. John the Baptist let King Herod know that he is an evil man. He let the Pharisees and Sadducees know that they are teaching religiousness instead of righteousness. And he promised that God is coming with a sharpened axe in one hand and a flaming torch in the other hand, and he is going to clean up all the dead wood in the society of Israel and larger world. As you can imagine, a message like this won John a lot of converts. 
if a drone was flying over the desert east of Jerusalem, you would have seen a colorful string of pilgrims that stretched a long, long way to an encampment by the river. He didn't need to ask money for any church structure. He didn't need a church. His church was there in the wilderness. He heard people's confession. He renewed their hope that God was not abandoning them. At last, the world is going to be a different place, he told them. Here is the beginning of transformation. God has finally chosen someone to complete what he tries to accomplish in this world. Someone who is walking among them, even as John was speaking. And when finally John and Jesus met, that must have been something. John knows now things are going to get off the ground. Finally, God has sent his chosen one. It would not take long before things get rolling. The Messiah is now going to establish justice on earth. <coughs> At least that was the hope. And then Herod soldiers came and delivered the warrant for John's arrest. And the man who lived as far <coughs> from human corruption as it was possible is caged in Herod's prison like a rat. The good news was that at least Jesus was at large, still free, still hastening the kingdom. And that was the only consolation that John had. Now, Herod's way of treating political opposition might not be according to <coughs> Geneva's convention or political customs of 21st century, but his way of treating the prisoners was not bad for 2,000 years ago because John was able to keep up with what Jesus was doing, even talk to his disciples, even send the disciples to Jesus and receive messages back. So, yeah, very nice way of treating a prisoner 2,000 years ago. The early reports about Jesus' ministry that John received were encouraging. <clears throat> he heard about miraculous healings, exorcism, plenty of signs and wonders, and he thinks, that's good. Now it's going to happen. Now people are going to get the big announcement. Jesus is finally going to declare God's judgment that would give him the authority that he needed. The problem was that the announcement never came. And John is sitting there in his jail, only reporting that Jesus is playing some kind of a doctor with marginal people like lepers, demoniacs, hemorrhaging women, even a Roman centurion, helping people, slaves. What kind of witness was that to God's justice? How is that going to help people to distinguish the right from wrong? <laughs> now, we don't know what all went through in his mind as he's sitting there in Herod's jail. What we know is that Jesus never organized a picket line outside of jail or did anything to release him. He was his cousin, and as, as far as we know, he did not even visit him in the prison. And so when the disciples from John finally come to Jesus, it's about the laxity of his spiritual practice. Are you the one who was supposed to come or should we wait for another? Or to put it plainly, was I wrong about you? It surely looks like I was wrong about something. If I was right about you, then I was wrong about the Messiah. And if I was right about the Messiah, then I was wrong about you. If you know who you are, then just plainly say so. We have no time to waste. And if you are not the one who was supposed to come, we need to reopen the search process really fast. And Jesus didn't <clears throat> say anything. Instead, he turned to John's disciples to see things that are taking place. Not the ones they are looking for, but to look at people who are following Jesus. There was this twitching group, sure enough. 
but who are they? They were the lucky ones, sure. There are plenty of blind people who were still blind. There are plenty of dead people who were still dead and never resurrected. The Gospels speak only about three. Jesus could not get around to everybody and do what was in their mind a sign that he is the true Messiah. And so Jesus sends a message back. Reread Isaiah 35. And of course, John doesn't need to reread it. He can recite it in his memory. And suddenly, John realizes to his horror that Jesus is not focusing on the part that John was focusing about God coming with his vengeance and the terrible punishment for all those who are wicked. But he is focusing on the part where the lame are re leaping like a deer, the tongue of the speechless is singing for joy. And as a PS, Jesus adds another beatitude. And blessed is the one who can handle the disappointment. Blessed is the one who can handle that God does not always work the way we want him to work. John wanted a Messiah who would be impossible to miss, that will clean the camp, who will witness to the omnipotent righteousness of God, who will be the Messiah that everybody will be impressed with. And instead, he gets a steady drip of mercy and grace, amazing grace, for people deserve <coughs> it. He gets a Messiah that plenty of people see no Messiah potential at all. And John is wondering what kind of joke is God playing on him to send such an unenergetic savior as the promised Messiah. Now, of course, you know that then it finally changed, right? Jesus died. Mm -hmm. Jesus was marvelously resurrected on Easter Sunday and everything changed. And now the world would get out that God brought him back to life, <laughs> dead. And finally, everybody saw the light and repented on the spot faced with the miracle like that, right? Mm -hmm. People revised their priorities. They reformed their values. They resolved to live the way Jesus wanted them to live. And God rewarded them with large crowds of people. Because now everybody knows who Jesus is. Everybody believes that he opened the door to heaven. And that through him, God is at work right now. True? No. Maybe not at everyone. But at least God has got you. So... Sometimes when you expect a fireball from heaven and you expect a blast of raw power that finally God will sweep the world and do this and that. And so finally all the doubts will get away. Instead, you get a steady drip of mercy from the followers of a man named Jesus who is still playing a doctor and a healer to a lot of marginal people unimportant people around the world. Drip, drip, drip. Not big stories, not big headlines, just small stories of small people. A few here, a few there. And at times you must be wondering, have we been abandoned by God? Do you want to listen to bold <laughs> claims of faith? <clears throat> And then you look at modest yields and results, especially in our part of the world, and are, you are tempted to ask, are you the one or are we to wait for another? Is this the church that God established <coughs> or should we wait, look for another? I read the other day the reason why the water shapes cannons in the rock is not because of power 
it's because it's persistence. Drop by drop, short lived, and the rock is transformed the way that no tidal wave can do it. And that explains why God works like that. To reveal his character, every grace, drop by drop, day after day, year after week after week, year after year, millennium after millennium, is transforming the world. And as we go back to our offices and committees and do our work, which might seem insignificant, irrelevant. This is something to ponder. Every time as we live as he loved us, another drop falls. Every time we treat people who are marginal people with dignity and grace, another drop falls. Another way of life is influenced. And one day, the rock will be reshaped. And blessed are those who can handle their life's disappointment and who take no offense how God is working when we expect him to work in a different way. Amen. Mm -hmm.